I'm John Canales Gorchinski with my co host Jeff Reichman, and welcome to Conversation with the Candidate, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Houston Education Fund and Houston Media Source. Uh, in this conversation, we will be talking with candidates for Houston City Council at large position number two. All candidates for the position were invited to participate, and the candidates present uh, were the ones that responded. Um, please, uh, we really hope that you enjoy tonight's program, or this program, and I will kick it over to Jeff for an introduction. Uh, Council Member David Robinson is Houston City Council at large position two incumbent. David is an architect who started his own company as a sole practitioner with an emphasis on building large commercial and industrial buildings in 1999. He also teaches a graduate level course here in Houston for Texas Tech University on planning and development called Infrastructure in the Urban Environment. Along with his architectural practice, David has been actively involved with neighborhood issues. He served eight years as an officer of the Near Town Association, including a couple of terms as president. He was elected to serve as chairman and president of the Citywide Super Neighborhood Alliance to a maximum two-year term that concluded in 2013. In 2007, he was appointed to the City of Houston Planning Commission by Mayor Bill White and reappointed by Mayor Nice Parker in 2009, becoming the first licensed architect to serve the city as commissioner since the 1970s. David Robinson received a BA in architecture from Yale College and earned a Master of Architecture degree from Rice University in 1993. David is the proud father of Elissa, a 15-year-old who attends Lanier Middle School. They are active members of Palmer Memorial Episcopal Church and love living here in the great city of Houston, Texas. Council Member? It's great to be with you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, John. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Uh, we're going to jump right in with the tough stuff, unfunded pension liability. Right. Um, it's a major issue for the city of Houston. It certainly is. And what are your ideas on how to address the current pension issues? And how, to, how would you prevent similar issues from happening in the future? Well, it's, a, it's an important question for the f uh, city to face right now. And, and there's been no shortage of discussion at the Horseshoe through the first year and a half of my first term here. Um, we're really looking at that in a number of ways, but through the Budget and Fiscal Affairs Committee of, this, of the city uh, council. And in this case, we know that we have three um, pension funds, that of the municipal employees and the police officers, as well as the firefighters. All three of those pensions uh, are important for the reasons you state, uh, ultimate sustainability within the financial budget of the city. And uh, they are, however, unequal in how they are governed and regulated. And I think to get to a position where the city has more fundamental um, responsibility for how they are uh, operated, uh, in particular with the firefighters, is a very important issue. Uh, with legislative control in Austin, that's something that City Council has really been uh, handcuffed and with regards to any opportunity to get to the table to meet and confer in a, in a positive form. I think we do have an excellent relationship with our uh, firefighters who do such important work for us as with the police officers and our municipal employees. So we we owe it to our employees and especially especially those who we've made promises to to hold our promises uh, as we go forward but to get to a place where we have more sustainable models uh, we need to have a really functional government that works with council with our Austin delegation of elected officials and in that regard it is of utmost importance that we have uh, open dialogue with all parties uh, so the city can be secure in its future as well as our uh, uh, first defenders and, and uh, important public uh, servants. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so in a city as large as Houston, uh, building and maintaining infrastructure is a real challenge. True. Of course. Um, how do you think the city should tackle its infrastructure issues? Mm -hmm. And including, we want to know how to pay for it. Right. Well, I guess uh, I would be naive if you didn't know a little bit about re Rebuild Houston, which is what the, the drainage fee, as some people, or drainage tax even call it. But what we've been doing to pay down the debt of a fund that pays for infrastructure projects and really in a transparent way is a lockbox, as we voted as uh, the, the citizens of Houston in 2010. And now I think working into that legacy, that program that is building both uh, road and drainage projects for our city, 
Um, we need to continue to administrate that program in a way that is transparent, efficient, utilizing all the best technology. I think part of perhaps what I bring to the council is my experience in the public realm and as a practicing architect, some of those details, uh, whether you're a firm believer in complete streets or in studying the floodplain, we know a lot of information about where the most important projects need to go and we need to be very careful with our money um, and those tax dollars that are precious to us so that we're good stewards of our resources and spread that uh, around the city in a way that is fair to all parts of town and um, as, as we say in the city address the worst first and that's that's a challenging um, program it's something difficult to live up to but I think we are um, in in the process of getting into our stride I think the new uh, relatively new now director of public works and and engineering is a good man and he is administrating the program very well but we we can do better and I think that's something that we are all putting our shoulder to the wheel for okay um, Councilmember, when candidates speak of crime prevention, they often propose a formula of more cops equals less crime. But in reality, the systemic causes of crime are linked to issues of education, of poverty, of opportunity. Mm -hmm. What crime intervention and prevention policies do you support that will systemically address crime? Well, I'm, I've had the pleasure and the benefit of sitting uh, on, on the horseshoe next to our former chief of police, C.O. Bradford, who has been uh, a wonderful colleague, I think, on the, on the council, as well as someone who has spent a great deal of time developing a program that he calls uh, community policing. And that's something that really speaks to me in the experience that I've had as a neighborhood leader and a community activist, really, in ways that uh, relate to our City of Houston Super Neighborhood Association program and and where I have served as a neighborhood leader we're familiar in our part of town as in other parts of Houston where with the PIP program the partnership in crime prevention and that is something that we really um, we need to engage with HPD um, there has been a uh, very well vetted process of analysis trying to look carefully at the way that we do our policing right now and what uh, is recommended for going forward and I think we're we're taking account of some of those recommendations and trying to implement them I, I think you, you're right to ask the question about whether more cops in cars is going to be the sole solution but I think we can be smarter and more efficient and I think in in ways that we've seen across the country there need to be a more um, um, open dialogue between citizens in Houston and the police and I think our Chief McClelland understands that in principle and he is uh, moving forward to to actuate on that. So Councilmember you mentioned community policing and PIP and for those that don't know and are watching this if you could explain what your sense of what those mean and how they would specifically address right. these systemic issues. Well I think I'll, from my experience a lot can be gained from uh, in another sense meeting and conferring in this case between our officers and administrators of the police force as well as and our, our community citizens getting together in a public forum in a library or a public space someone somewhere where a facility is offered to us uh, be it in a school or a church um, these are places that we can access as public officials and as an at-large council member I will tell you that I work with all of the district council members in all 11 of our districts and that there are there are different problems in different parts of towns which is not a surprise but it's something that that suggests that there would not be a one-size-fits-all solution for Houston and that different types of crime uh, merge and uh, are more prevalent in different parts of town so we have to be smart about that um, I know I just spoke with uh, an officer in his cruiser uh, a few blocks from here um, and it's interesting you you get a real sense that they know the territory and some of those what we used to call beat cops um, you know they're the boots on the ground they know what's going on I've got great faith in our police officers I, I feel I, I have a excellent dialogue with both representatives of the Union as well as uh, the brass in the force and this is it's very important for us to link up some of what we do in neighborhood leadership where citizens can feel empowered there are you know plenty of Houstonians that don't have 
uh, a computer and rely on their neighbors and uh, the little lady down the street, the classic example of someone who relies on her community for news and if there is uh, urgent issues that are surrounding us. Many of us are informed by smartphones and, and uh, internet alerts and advisories, but we've got we've to work on this together. And I think that's part of the PIP model and uh, what community policing can really do if we open it up to the citizens of Houston. Thank you for expanding on that. Mm -hmm. Well, similarly, similarly um, not everybody has access to the internet. Not everybody has a computer. Not everybody has a car in Houston either. That's true. Uh, what is your vision for public transportation and transit uh, as it relates to Houston and kind of what's happening right now? Well, I am a big believer in public transportation, and I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, in a day or two from today, uh, Metro will be unveiling its new uh, reimagined system network for its bus service, which is really the backbone of our system. It is what uh, we've built on. We have an absolutely efficient park and ride system, uh, second to none in the nation. And those things are great for those suburban commuters who are trying to get efficiently into town. It's a very tempting and worthwhile um, way to save time in the morning and at rush hour in the evening to get home and get to work in the morning um, by way of the, uh, the bus uh, system and, and some of those high-speed lanes. So expanding on that, I do believe, is part of the solution. I, I am a believer that concrete is not always the solution and that some um, intermodal systems, by that we mean uh, uh, the light rail that is coming and I think uh, about to really be a marvelous asset for the city of Houston and something that we can really celebrate as we come up with the uh, Final Four and the Super Bowl coming to town in the next few years. Uh, so there, there's exciting things happening, but I'm a, whether it's bus rapid transit like what we see that's going to be taking place on uh, the Post Oak Corridor in Uptown or some of what we're seeing now here in the East End where um, the Harrisburg Line and, and the Southeast Line are accessing some of our universities in a way that I, I feel that I'm, uh, I think we need to continue to expand that program. With our last few minutes left, um, we, and we do want to leave time for you to address the voters directly. Okay. Um, but just quickly, um, with oil prices well below $60 a barrel, many Houstonians are at risk for losing their jobs, and mm -hmm. thousands already have. That's right. Uh, what policies and programs should be in place to protect our city's economy? Well, I think one thing that we've done um, in the last few decades, frankly, is diversify our portfolio of, of solid business performers with, with the Texas Medical Center with the transportation hubs of our international airports and the fantastic uh, um, evidence and, and truth behind the, uh, the Port of Houston. We have a much more diverse portfolio than we did, say, in the 80s when uh, the oil and gas crisis really came to a head with our much more monolithic uh, culture when we were so focused on petroleum-based products. And now, I think, with that diversification, I didn't even mention the Texas Medical Center, the largest medical center in the world, we are blessed. You know, Houston is a fantastic place for all of these things. And, and while you're right, John, the, uh, the economy is constricting in certain sectors, and we're hoping that the uh, price of oil can turn, and there's some um, projections that that's going to be heading in the right direction here shortly. Um, I, I think we need to do everything we can uh, to help manufacturing, to help uh, those who are the job creators out there. As a small business owner, I know that I'm um, very uh, reliant on the state of our economy here, and uh, I think we, uh, we need it to do very well. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the conversation. We will give you the last minute to address the voters directly and tell them why they should reelect you to Houston City Council at large position, too. Very good. Thanks again for this time with you. And, thank you. And folks, I, uh, having served for a little over a year and a half now as your at large city council member, I'll tell you that it's, it's been a great honor. Um, I have a wonderful staff. I have a great uh, position on the horseshoe serving you at large, all 640 square miles of this wonderful city. Every neighborhood, every great uh, diverse citizen of the uh, great city of Houston. Um, in this case, I feel it, it's important to emphasize that I've had two distinct um, 
appointments. One is to be the vice chair of the uh, Quality of Life Committee that has d direct responsibility and oversight for uh, the departments of planning and development, parks and recreation, the Department of Neighborhoods, libraries, and the Department of Health and Human Services. And in addition to that, there's a one category that's not a department, but it's defined as issues related to uh, culture and international affairs. And in that regard, I am bilingual. I speak Spanish and uh, uh, practice it every day. I think in that regard, I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of our consular uh, ambassadors and uh, the folks that work with international trade. I am a cheerleader. I'm the father of a cheerleader. You did mention that my daughter was at Lanier Middle School. She's actually just finished her freshman year at Lamar High School. Uh, but she's taught me a little bit about cheerleading, and I hope I can be um, your uh, second term uh, at-large council member position number two. Council Member David Robinson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we are going to take a quick break and reset, and we'll be right back with the next candidate. Welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates. My name is Jeff Reichman and I have upgraded my shirt. Actually, what you're seeing today is a live broadcast. What you were seeing previously in the interview with Councilmember David Robinson was a previously recorded um, interview that we had done prior to the general election. So welcome back. This is uh, Conversations with the Candidates. Uh, brought to you by the League of Women Voters Education Fund and Houston Media Source. My, na my name is Jeff Reichman. My co-host is Mike Webb. And uh, we are here with uh, Willie Davis, who is running for City Council at Large Position 2. Uh, we don't have a written biography for Mr. Davis, so uh, welcome. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and why you're running for office. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank to both of you. It's good to be here. Well, I'm running for office because I have a passion for my city, uh, for Houston. I love this city, and it's been my home for uh, these 60-plus uh, years. I was born and raised here in Houston and uh, here in the Third Ward community, and um, I was educated in this city. And um, I went from college uh, here into the Army, went into the United States Army, uh, served uh, my country, came back, and uh, did like most people. I had a family, children, worked um, in both. I've had experience working in industrial and worked for corporations. I uh, worked um, in the every area pretty much that you can, can imagine. Of course, if you count all of my third war, uh, other jobs like throwing papers and working in grocery stores, I did all of that. And, uh, and so uh, I pastored, uh, been a pastor in the city of Houston now for 30 years. Um, and I had one short uh, tenure pastorate in Chicago, Illinois. And I pastored there for three and a half years, and then I came back to Houston, organized the church that I'm pastoring now, and um, this year uh, began to see the conditions since 2010 on my return, the conditions that are going on in my city that I love, and uh, I'm not pretty favor. I'm not favorable about the conditions that I see and the kind of conditions that's going to be the bedrock of the future of our city because Houston is a very fast growing city and uh, we're no longer the number four, we're the number three. So I've had the opportunity to live in both and uh, the number three and the number four. And now I'm back to 
the city that's going to be number three. And so um, I'm, I decided to make my voice heard about the, what I'm really displeased about. Excellent. That's great, Mr. Davis. First question. Houston is known as the country's most diverse city. Mm -hmm. What do you see as what do you see as the value in our diversity and what would you do to capitalize on this distinction? Great question. Houston is a very diverse city. And uh, I, I think that that's that my opponent um, uh, is pretty, in my point of view, could not uh, be uh, capitalized on that aspect more than I have, using the fact of my uh, military experience, which I've traveled quite a bit. And as a pastor, I travel quite a bit. And I've looked at different cultures and the community cultures all across uh, the United States as well as abroad overseas. Um, when I see Houston becoming, which we've already done, and I think has been kind of a misperception out there, Houston is a diverse city. And it became a diverse city because of the welcoming spirit, the power of economics, uh, the acceptance into the community. And so that's a plus for Houston. And uh, we, we've grown that into being that city nationally without there being any problems prior. So I don't see that anything gonna stop us from continuously being a very diverse uh, community with like, what, uh, 14 different uh, dialects that I've last heard. So I, I see our city even doing better and showing the rest of the world how to do it. That's great. Well, this question is about the economy. With oil prices below $40 a barrel, many Houstonians are at risk for losing their jobs, and in fact, tens of thousands of them already have. Mm -hmm. What policies and programs should be in place to protect our city's economy? Oh, that's an even, a, a even greater question, because what has made Houston Houston uh, that makes us a distinctively different city than most is because we are the oil capital of, of the world, right here in this city, right here in the southwest, uh, or down the part, part of the state as the southeast. But um, the, the thing about that is, is this. What we have done over the past six years with all of the oil and the economy in the, in the debacle that it is in, Houston has went through the hardest times economically. Uh, during 07 and 08, when we went through the real hard economic hard times and down times, Houston was still thriving. And it was still because foundationally the city was set up to, to, to go through that. Now, the, the strange part about that right now and the troubling part about that right now is the fact that, that in, this past, in this past previous administration, we have not capitalized on the industry that we uh, we should be. We've lost uh, our grip on on inviting businesses into Houston. And if we don't make a change, if this administration, the new administration is the mayor, and a council uh, with new added people on that council, if we don't get a handle of that, uh, we're gonna be in trouble because we're already in trouble with high debt for the past six years and years before that, I must add, and it's a growing problem. So if we don't get a handle on that, moving into the third largest city in the country position with 500 more people coming in every month, which is going to generate a community in terms of homes and whatever, but you gotta have businesses. You gotta have something that generates that capital to help strengthen the city. Earlier you talked about um, improving conditions in our city. Mm -hmm. How can we improve law enforcement relationships with communities of color and the GLBT community? I think what needs to happen, and uh, I like to let the public know that um, when I served in the United States Army, I was born and raised in this city. I watched our city grow from a mini miniature number of communities of diversities. Uh, into an even metropolitan city in diversity. I grew up in that. I went to high school and elementary school and middle school in that, and even on to college. What I see happening is living in other cities like Chicago, which I had a short tenure that I lived there, which is an older city and had diversities of different uh, communities, uh, people. Here's what I see. What I see that the police department in our city need our enforcement 
that they are manned properly. And I wanted, I referred to my time in the military because I was a race relation instructor in the United States Army. Uh, God gave me the gift, the policy, the, the gift to become a pastor, to be called to the ministry. I'm a lover of all people. I may not love what everybody does, but I am a lover of people. And the reality is every one of us have a right to live as we live and be protected by that. So we need a law enforcement, a police department that's sensitive to all of our communities, no matter who live in the communities, but they have to be sensitive and that comes by training. And when our law enforcers have proper training and when the, when the mayor and the administration of the mayor and the council understand that, then we better know how to direct our law enforcers, how to be sensitive to whether you are in a predominant black community or white community or Hispanic or Asian or LBGT. But if you don't know and understand that uh, part, then you will have a problem. But I think we need to work more on giving our police departments all that they need in order to, to have fair you know, equity across all of our communities. Let's talk about pensions for a moment. Unfunded pension liability is a major issue for the city of Houston. Mm -hmm. And now that our elected officials are elected to four-year terms instead of two-year terms, uh, what are your ideas about how to address these current pension issues and how to prevent similar situations in the future from your role as a city council member? Uh, that has been a major topic during this, this race uh, with the pension uh, funding to our police department. Um, as you both may know, in the city charter, the mayor we have a strong mayoral uh, form of government, uh, which in turn means that the mayor uh, puts forth that plan. And it, then it's up to the council for all of us to look at that plan and decide whether or not, and negotiating with the police union and others as to how that plan goes forth. We're, we're threading on a very dangerous thing with our police department, especially with a growing system that we have as a city, uh, because I have always alluded to this, wherever there's prosperity, crime follows. So if we don't equip our police department with a, a strong pension plan that gives our officers the right and the, and the freedom to feel like I want to be a police officer and I want to protect this city. If we don't do that and give them and their family more assurance, then we're going to have a problem. Uh, we are, we are under, we are undermanned in our city as relates to police protection. Uh, as I said in my previous time in Chicago, they have 13,000. Now we're moving to number three or in number three large city. They have 13,000 where we are working with five. And what I've been told there's about 1,400 that's, that's qualified, qualified right now to walk out the door in retirement. So what we have to do, we have to look at the plan that's already on the table. And then we have to work with the mayor as the mayor worked with the council. And we have to come up with something that's, that's, that's affordable and it's fundable and that we all can live with within the, the system that we have now. But we have to protect the, our police department and we have to assure them as well as other city workers. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on that briefly. Regarding the fire pensions, um, do yeah. you support local control of all of the municipal worker pensions? Yes, I, I, I do. I, I did, uh, uh, when I was asked that, I do in fa I favor local control because, I mean, you know, whatever problem that Houston has, no one outside of us is going to come in and solve our problem. So we've got to learn to do it. Now, I'm sure some would debate that they think the state ought to do it versus the city. But let's 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 we, we are the people in control of our own destiny. So uh, I do believe in local control of that of those plans. And like I say, I'm sure that's going to be a lot of discussion on that when I get there. <laughs> As you know, Mr. Davis, many Houstonians depend on public transportation just to get to work. What is your vision for our public transportation here in Houston? That is a wonderful question. Um, I grew up in this city when uh, you probably, I date both of you, so I'm sure you probably never heard of the word rapid transit. <laughs> <laughs> but I grew up in this city when we had rapid transit. That was our bus system at the time. 
And uh, I've watched our city grow into this metropolitan city with what we have now. We went from buses, now we at the point of rails, and you know, and now we even, they even talking now doing monorails from city to city. So um, I love it, I like what's going on, but there are some problems. And what we need to do, uh, there are some uh, areas that are not being served, that are being underserved as it relates to the, tr the transit, uh, transportation in our city. On top of the fact that we're dealing with a huge growth of drivers on the roads and the expressways, so we need to come up with a with a with a with a comfortable program that's going to be feasible and affordable. Uh, the rail system that we have, I think, is going to be a, a plus, um, you know, and I think that we need to diversify it. There's some bus problems and routes that we are uh, that are you know, that being um, misused right now and not used properly to getting the people in the right time. So Metro leadership along under the city is gonna have to work together and see how we can uh, improve the area of, met of tra rapid transit, uh, transportation system in our city so that all of our city is served and not underserved. Just to follow up a little bit, mm -hmm. can you be a little bit more specific on which areas of Houston are underserved by our public transportation system and how can your, how does your vision improve those services? Well, what, what I do, most of our communities are the predominantly uh, low income or predominantly communities that are that need that all they have is southeast part of our city uh, some of the areas like acres home uh, what we call the fofo they those are some areas that have not that transportation and the busing has been rerouted and they don't have the adequate access to that now what we're going to have to do metro has already attempted to address that problem but i think what what along what with my opinion, once we look at that, once I have a chance to look at that and understand it as, as council and the new mayor will, then we could come up with something where everybody feels like they're getting adequate transportation. Um, I, I support a rail system, but I also support the fact that we need buses and those buses need to get to areas of the city where people feel like they're not being inconvenient in terms of getting no bus, and that's one of the problems we have. We're gonna have to either diversify the routes and the places where buses are not going if it means that we have to do that in order to supplement any problems that people are having in terms of getting adequate transportation in our city. That's great. This is the pothole question. Um, in a city as large as Houston, building and maintaining infrastructure is a challenge. Mm -hmm. How do you think the city should tackle its infrastructure issues, including how to pay for it? There's been a lot of discussion through this mayoral uh, race mm -hmm. about different ways of financing infrastructure. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, I did not support the uh, program which the mayor submitted to the city of Houston as relates to the drainage uh, tax, uh, rain tax, or as they call it. Uh, listen, they called it a fee, but it certainly wasn't a fee, it's a tax. When everybody gotta pay it, it's a tax, it's not a fee. And I argued about that, because that was earmarked to help the infrastructure. That's what we were told, that's what we were sold, that this was going to be the, the new cure-all for helping the city of Houston and if infrastructure so that it would curtail the flooding that we're having. Well, that we know didn't happen. That is not happening. So right now, we have a problem. And with that problem, the infrastructure of our city is damaged, and it's damaged badly. It's been a lot of talk, it's been a lot of, a lot of issues around that. And I think Houston as a whole, the people have to sit down and really think about that. We can't be, continue to be told that we're paying for something that we're not getting. And then to be told that, well, it's gonna take time. Uh, we were told that the infrastructure problems with the drainage being involved with that would take 20 years before this process starts. Well, as it stands right now, we don't have 20 years. We don't have 20 years to do that. Now, how do we fix it? Number one, again, I go back to the type of government we have. We're gonna have to have a mayor that has a comprehensive plan that we could present to council and council has to vote on that, not give it a lot of talk. See what we're doing, uh, our present opponent who support the mayor 
in this issue, um, uh, my opponent, and, and we can't deal with that program anymore. Now we know it didn't work, so we got to fix it. And then we got to put people in office that can fix it and not rubber stamp it because you are friends with the mayor, or you partner, or agree with the mayor on everything. That's not going to help. How do we get the dollars? We're going to have to come up with a, with a plan in order that we can fix the infrastructure, use the dollars which we already have within budget without going over budget. We have to find a way to do it. On the basis that there are expenditures that are going on that are totally unnecessary. We need to put priority, and infrastructure is a priority, because guess what? Infrastructure gonna hurt everybody, it doesn't matter where you live. It, you know, last time flooding <clears throat> Memorial Day was in my land. The other times it was downtown Houston. I 45 North was another time. Uh, I remember back in 01. Uh, when we had Delicia, and it was just a, a thunderstorm, and the whole east side of the city uh, and north of the city was was flooded. So, you know, we have a real problem, and we really got to fix it. Mr. Davis, Houston has been ranked 15th worst major city in terms of income inequality. Mm -hmm. What are your plans to bridge the gap caused by that fact? Income inequality. Well, <clears throat> First of all, in terms of income, uh, I do believe that we need to uh, give more income, especially to uh, the uh, minimum wage. I think that needs to be something to work out in terms of minimum wage. I believe people deserve it because the rate of, of inflation and other things that we probably looking at our country condition, we're probably going to move into a recession. So with that, we've got to again have an administration and a, and, a, and a council that looks at these things in a hard line and look at where we can with the help uh, certainly of our legislature and to be the kind of people who can bring some negotiation. Now, let me say, on the basis of that, I know that we live in a city, this is a nonpartisan position that I'm running for, but I want everybody to know it's a nonpartisan, but the position of, as at large is to Look at all of the city. You can't look for econ uh, uh, income and equality only for one sector of the city. The position of the people at large to, to support the district council, to support the mayor, and make sure that we have fair equity all across the city. Now, we're 15th, if that's the number. I don't know what that statistic is. Uh, I'll trust your, your number of that, that the city, that Houston is 15th. But here's what I will say that uh, as it relates to equality, everybody supports equality. I don't know of anyone who don't support equality, but the fact of the matter is, uh, we, I don't think equality is not served right when it's not fair equity all across the city. You can't do it in one area and not do it in the other. So I do support uh, that we need to increase uh, the, uh, what is fair and equitable for higher income. And also, I certainly support that it ought to be fair across the board. To me, that would be equally, you know, equality. I just want to clarify, are you saying you support increasing the minimum wage for both public and private employees in Houston? Well, I, I support what is, what is feasible within the guidelines. I, I, I support the fact that if we're going to talk about uh, economy or increasing income, that we need to do where it's, where it's equitable within the means of where we are as a city because we do know, uh, as I stated when I lived in Chicago, um, one of the things that Chicago is wrestling with today is high taxes, which in terms, uh, the, more, the more money you pull from people, uh, no matter if you gave them three raises or if you raised the, the minimum income three times, if everything else keep going up, then they're right back where they started. So I just believe that it ought to be done, maybe if that's to answer your question in terms of income and equity, then it has to be something that has to be looked at by the upcoming administration and the council. Great. Thank you. Mr. Davis, when candidates speak of crime prevention, they often propose a formula of more cops equals less crime, mm -hmm. when in reality the systemic causes of crime are linked to issues of education, issues of poverty, issues of opportunity. What crime intervention and prevention policies do you support that will systemically address crime? That is a great question, and I tell you, I love to answer that one. 
Yes, they generally, when they talk about crime, they generally always associate it with <clears throat> education, right? But what we also see is this, when there's no fair opportunity being placed in the community, we also know that crime is created, as I said earlier, wherever there's prosperity, crime will follow. But we also have to keep in mind where there's no fair equity being put in a certain communities, then what do you do have? You do have the idea that people, by and large, are going to find there's more crime in that particular area when there's no opportunity. We need to um, and let it be known that I served as the ministry advisory president. That was an organization called the Ministry Advisory Board to the mayor. And I served that under Mayor Lee P. Brown and Mayor Bill White. And what that did, ecumenical pastors across the city, different denominations, we had access to the mayor's office. We had access to council. And whenever there was a problem in our communities, we were able to bring that to the mayor in a discussion. And then they would come in and bring in any leader department of that city. And with that, we were able to tell them if we had after school programs, if we had more economic development in our communities, which creates a, a, an economic empowerment that also empowers the church. We as pastors across the city, we're doing these things every day. But when you have a city administration who, who blocks us out, that keeps us out, when you have a council as my opponent who never shows up in any of our communities to, to you at an at-large. You're not a district councilman, you're an at-large councilman. So, so the, the, the at-large position is I could go anywhere in this city and I need, to do, I need to go everywhere in this city to see what the problems are. And we haven't had that. So what happens is if we can get more dollars spent through community development corporations, churches across the city have CDC, and uh, they have the opportunity to create jobs by uh, schools and create jobs by after-school programs. And uh, it's interesting uh, that this, this soon-to-be past administration, we didn't have these programs. Now, if you could go outside the city and get money for other issues, it would seem like you could get some money to come in the city that would help us to create more programs that would curtail the crime. Because when you don't have dollars in our communities, then they're going to create a dollar. And that's unfortunate. Awesome. On a slightly different note, Mr. Davis, Houston has a vibrant theater, art, and museum districts like the Pro Project Row Houses in Third Ward. Yes. But many have criticized the city for not doing enough to support small arts organizations and independent artists. Mm -hmm. If elected, what would you do to ensure that we have a well-rounded, thriving arts community? Oh, that's, that's, that's another good one. I want to address that too because I don't want anybody thinking that when I become uh, council at large that, that that's certainly not going to be a topic on, on my paper is going to be because you know what interestingly you asked me that question I had one young lady who is a writer and she's definitely involved in arts and notice what happens there are no art facilities in the black and Hispanic communities there are a lot of great writers in this city and a lot of people who are very talented in arts and so here's the deal we get all these dollars that are generated dollars given by great private organizations or whatever, and none of that dollar comes into those areas where we have that. Think about it. If we had more programs, which I promised her that I was gonna advocate that once I'm on council, because in Southeast Houston, in north of the city, and some of the inner city areas, we need to get those programs in our own community I love the arts, I love the symphony, I love the plays and different things we have. And it makes Houston a very credible and a loving city in terms of tourism when you can get people in to follow the arts. But let's face it, if arts, and we do know, it generates a lot of businesses as well. Mm -hmm. So again, we need to focus on bringing those type of things inside our communities as well. I think we need more of it, and I'm gonna advocate that some of those dollars go there. It's clear that conversations around the city's revenue cap are going to continue to surface in the next administration. Yes. Um, 
I'd like to know more about your position on that. What effect do you think, positive or negative, the revenue cap has uh, on the city? And what's your stance on whether or not to lift it or modify it? Well, <clears throat> revenue caps, again, has been a big issue in the Mayor Oriel. Um, a lot of times what we hear, and, and I understand it because since we are a Mayor Oriel driven city, uh, those candidates that are running for mayor, most of them are asked about the revenue caps and they'll, you know, people hear from them as to how they address it. Uh, put the city on a revenue ca a cap, I think would be a definitely an appropriate way to go putting the cap simply because we have a debt. So you got to deal with a debt. You can't spend what you don't have. So, but it also doesn't mean that, um, uh, that a revenue cap will solve everything. But if you have a budget process where it is looked at in detail and people have an opportunity to look at it and a council have an opportunity to look at it because some of those areas within the budget dollars are going that don't necessarily need to go there. And so if you have a comprehensive revenue cap, you now are saying to uh, the city and every department that listen, work within the basis of this and when things are better, when the city has more dollars to deal with, then you can associate and do more things with it. But in the meantime, we need to balance the budget. You know, we need to balance what we have. We got a $5.1 billion budget and we're spending over 50% of that is in debt. The city's in trouble. So we need to cap, I believe, where we are, get the balances and the dollars straight, and then we need to come up with more comprehensive programs in order that we can use those dollars where they're adequately needed. Mr. Davis, what are your plans to address issues like overcrowding and underperforming, underperformance in our Houston schools? Oh. Well, first of all, that again is a very sensitive subject when it comes to me because I was educated in Third Ward, Texas, mm -hmm. in the schools that I loved and all my fellow friends in there. It's heartbreaking to see that we have some 60 plus schools have been closed. A disproportion of our community, particularly in the minority community, has suffered. And it's interestingly, we have a real serious problem there because why? We voted on bonds to build better schools and to build new schools to provide better programs and new technological programs. And unfortunately, that has not happened. There is a lot of misfunding of dollars within our school system, which directly affects our students, mm -hmm. which means you can't expect people to have an adequate education if you don't give them the tools to get it. We have a problem there. Now, that problem will have to be dealt with. And I think, uh, for me, uh, again, as an at-large, we should be concerned about that. We don't need a person at an at-large seat that don't even go visit a school, that never, my opponents never went into a school system to even discover what was going on inside. It's all over the news about the problems in our school system. We need to deal with a program. Now, I know now the trustee board uh, votes on a superintendent, but uh, I don't know if that's going to be what's going to be going on in the future. That's yet to be determined. But we need to come up with more adequate, first of all, accountability. Let me talk about that. First, there needs to be some accountability to the dollars that are being spent in other schools and not in the needed schools. We need to deal with that issue. We need to find out why it is that in some schools in our community, get all that they need in some schools in our community don't, and particularly in the minority schools. And so we have an issue that need to be dealt with. We need a mayor and a council that's sensitive and understanding where there's fair equity. I want everybody to know, I'm one who proposes fair equity across the board, everywhere. Houston is not east side, west side, north side, south side. Houston is Houston. Every part of those areas it identifies Houston. So uh, I think we have a real problem in uh, our educational system, and uh, I think there need to be some comprehensive change, and we're going to have to have a mayor with a vision and to bring it before a council that has a vision and to support what needs to help change our schools and make them better. That's great. 
How will you use technology to better serve and communicate with citizens? Um, first of all, you know, I, you know, when once once in office, I I plan to um, use all of the technology that's made available uh, within my budget to reach the 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 citizens of Houston. Houston's a big place. Uh, I know because I watched it grow. Uh, as I, you know, when I was born in this city, I was born on Scott Street. And uh, I remember when it was a two-lane, <laughs> and I'm sure when I say that to my children, they can't imagine Scott Street being a two-lane, but I do. And now it's it's a multi-lane with a rail down the middle. Uh, but we have to use technology. Uh, I, I hope to use everything possible within uh, my affordable budget in order to reach people because our city is huge, and I want to use those things and, and have a staff that know how to to use those type of proper things and use it because that's the world that we live in. Uh, along with that though, but I'm a very touchable person. I'm a pastor, I'm not a politician. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm the one who likes to know who I'm talking to, who get in my car and drive out there and see who you are and what seems to be your issue. Now I know I can't be everywhere at, at one time, but I think that when we have a concern for our people, so I think to use the technology that we have, have a system where people can reach you and you can communicate back to them. Uh, I plan to use everything that I possibly can, technological, and of course, I'm gonna need some smarter people in the millenniums to come in there and help me, but <laughs> I'll do that too. <laughs> and will probably be my last question. Uh, according to the Pew Research Center, mm -hmm. Houston leads the country in economic segregation, with affluent more likely to live among the affluence, mm -hmm. the poor among the poor, with fewer Houstonian, Houston neighborhoods hosting middle-class households. Mm -hmm. Professor Kleinberg has referred to residential economic de uh, segregation as one of our greatest challenges. Mm -hmm. What role can the city of Houston play in ensuring that there are thriving mixed income, middle-class, and low-income neighborhoods in Houston? Oh, that's another good question too, Mike. Thank uh, <clears throat> here's, here's something that I want to identify. In the, in the, in the um, faith community, we're always trying to come up with programs and opportunities how we can have equity among people. We know who our congregants are. We know the people who are the low income, the medium income, and the high income. We know they're not churches. Uh, pastors, we handle budgets and those type of thing on a day to day. But here is the deal. We have to learn and come up with ways in order to bridge all of that, that in, even in, the, in our community of faith, in order that we have right distribution. Now, from a city standpoint, given that, we should have people, again, on this council and a mayor with a kind of vision. We know the people that are affluent and we know the people who are the under income or low income people. We need a person who know how to cross the bridges. See what we gotta do, we've gotta stop. The more we do things to divide our city, the more, the harder it becomes for us to bring people together. One side, the affluent need to see the needs of, the, of those who are in need and then have a person, a, a, a leader as a mayor and a, and a council who understands that, rather than having a mayor and a council who's catering to one and not the other. So you gotta have someone who know how to cross all political lines, all color lines, all economic lines. Because think about it, if you don't do those three things, then you really just shot yourself in the foot. Because if I cater to these over here, knowing that these people need, and then we're stuck in the middle, then guess what? then these, the, the underserved would never get served. So uh, I remember there's a program uh, that was being offered by a pastor in his, our state, in his city where he lives. And what he did in order to help this economic program he presented was the affluent churches that were in the, uh, in the, uh, out in the uh, suburbs was, we brought a plan to where they would help the pastors and the churches that was in the urban communities and they partnered together so they would help to supply us with what we need in order so that everybody would have an equal kind of funding. Great idea. Take it to the city. 
I plan to present that to the city. So that way, everybody across the board, one is helping another, neighbor helping neighbor. That's great. I think that's where we're going to have to leave it tonight. So thank you for joining us, Mr. Thank Davis. You we appreciate your me. time. You, um, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, my co-host Mike Webb, Houston Media Source, and all the people who come together to make this program happen for you, my name is Jeff Reichman. If you are curious about your ballot, you can go to the League's website, vote411.org, for nonpartisan election advice for this municipal election. Again, thank you for watching, and we wish you a good evening. Thank you.